Well, good evening, and thank you for coming. As Dr. Masurik said, my name is Brian Schmidt, and I work here at New York University uh, seeing patients and also running a clinical research center. What I wanted to talk to you about is the relationship between human papillomavirus and a subset of head and neck cancers. And I have to tell you that the information that we're presenting to you is relatively new. And what I mean by new, it's information that has been developed and discovered over the last four to five years. The relationship between human papillomavirus and head and neck cancer was actually quite tenuous until a series of epidemiologic studies clearly demonstrated that infection with human papillomavirus is associated with oral pharyngeal cancer. And the oral pharyngeal cancers are the cancers that are a certain region of the head and neck, which involves the base of the tongue, Waldeyer's ring, as Dr. Mazurik said, as well as the tonsillar region. The group of HPV is a very large group. And I put up here 120 strains, but it's probably more. And it's a virus that's very common. And there's, within this group, viruses that cause no problem, viruses that can cause a small problem, such as warts on your hands or your fingers, and then viruses that can actually cause cancer. And we've known for some, sign, some time there's a very strong relationship between a subset of these viruses, which we call high risk, and cervical cancer. That's clearly established. And now we're understanding that HPV-16, which is one of the strains, is related to that subset of oral pharyngeal cancers. 16 and 18 are clearly risk factors for oral pharyngeal and really for the oral pharynx, base of tongue, which is the back of the tongue, the area that's difficult to see, and tonsillar are clearly related to 16. So what I wanted to address in my 10 minutes is are the questions that come up when we hear about a infectious disease. And I think back to 1982 when I was just entering into college and HIV was being discovered. And I and my friends were asking ourselves, first of all, who's infected and am I infected? And secondly, if I'm not infected, how could I get it or how is it transmitted? And then most importantly, how to avoid transmission. So those are the questions that I hope to answer. And when I talk about who's infected, what I'm talking about is the oral pharyngeal infection of HPV. So if I were just to present the question to you of who's infected with HPV, the truth is the majority of us that are of reproductive age are probably infected with HPV. That doesn't mean the type of HPV that causes cancer, but of those 200 strains, the majority of, this, of us in this room have HPV. And because of it, it's the most commonly sexually transmitted disease worldwide. So now the question comes, how do you get oral pharyngeal or oral HPV? When I present the next series of slides, I was very careful because this information is relatively new that I wanted to give you public information. And so what I did is I took a series of what we call in the industry peer-reviewed articles, meaning this is science that has been done by investigators. It's sent out to be reviewed by other scientists, and then ultimately it gets published. And what I've depicted here in the red box is actually the publication, and then I've taken a direct quote from that publication. The one that I'm showing here is very important. It was actually from a panel established by the National Cancer Institute, which is one of the institutes within, within the National Institute of Health. And on this panel, they convened experts, experts in head and neck cancer and experts in infectious disease. And they addressed this panel and asked them a series of questions. And one of the most important questions they ask is, how does one get oral pharyngeal HPV. And it's clear, you can see at the bottom here, that oral genital contact is the primary means of developing oral HPV. 
Said in, a number, said in another way, it's the number of oral sexual partners that you have that determines your risk. And we don't know that the relationship is linear, but it's clear that as the number of partners that you have where you interact with them oral sexually, the chance for getting oral HPV increases. No question with that. And that's the principal risk factor for exposure and then infection to HPV. Now realize that many of those infections will be completely asymptomatic, which means you'll never know that you have that infection. The question of whether you get infected and that infection maintains throughout your life, we don't know. There is the possibility that HPV could be cleared, but we simply don't know that at this time. And then finally, in terms of how is it transmitted, oral HPV infection is the principal risk factor for this distinct form of head and neck cancer. So if we take those HPV causes can caused cancer, it's clear that oral HPV infection is the primary risk factor. But we think that this is a very small percentage of the total head and neck cancers. How is it transmitted? And for that, I turn to another study um, that looked at another way. So if I were to talk to you about oral pharyngeal HPV infection, what I've already spoken to you, you can imagine that it would involve some form of oral sexual behavior. But what about patients that are already infected? Let's say a woman that has cervical HPV. Could she potentially infect herself in the oral cavity just during the normal day of, uh, of uh, normal hygiene? This paper demonstrated that that's highly unlikely, meaning that it'd be very unlikely for a woman to transfer an HPV infection from the genital region to her oral cavity. But it's also interesting to think about what we call vertical transmission, meaning can a woman inoculate or infect one of her children? And based on this study, we think that that's highly unlikely. What's interesting about this study is that as the children approached childhood or adolescence and became sexually active, that oral HPV infection rate increased. So self-inoculation is unlikely, vertical transmission is unlikely, really pointing the finger from person-to-person -person contact. Now this is controversial. These are highly respected investigators. In fact, this group um, was at Johns Hopkins. A couple of them have left, but they're really the ones that pinpointed HPV as a causative agent for oral pharyngeal HPV. And they were looking at different modes of transmission. And I have to say that the results are controversial. Not everyone agrees with this, but they, of course, stated that oral sex was a, mo was a mode of transmission, which I've already told you, but also open mouth kissing, or what we know in the lay uh, public as French kissing, was a way of transmitting HPV from one individual to another. So when you think about decreasing transmission rates, you have to possibly consider this. Another way to avoid transmission would obviously be the use of condoms. And we know that latex condoms are very good at preventing transmission. And it's the number one way worldwide of preventing HIV infection and has been very critical in controlling transmission of HIV. HPV, it turns out, human papillomavirus, can be a very infective virus and can actually go from one person to another simply through skin or mucosal contact. So there's the possibility that one could be wearing a condom and still transmit, but we think actually the latex condom itself prevents direct transmission through that latex, but obviously there would be a skin-to-skin -skin contact around the condom. If we think about, and, and it's a little bit different than HIV or herpes simplex, but if we think about the barrier technique, which would be condom use, it's a little bit different than when we, for HPV than when we think about HIV or herpes, especially if we consider that mouth to mouth, which really means the only way that we can significantly decrease transmission in the current population would be discretion in terms of the number of partners that one has. 
How about going forward and looking decades ahead? Is there any way that we can reduce transmission of HPV? Well, it's clear that vaccines will play a role in this. But the important thing to realize with vaccines, and we've learned this for the vaccines that have been made available, uh, particularly for young girls, is that you have to give those vaccines before there's sexual activity. So if we were able to administer a vaccine to both boys and girls at a young age, then they would be protected against the HPV. But once one has the HPV, the vaccine is of no use. And then ultimately, if one could prevent transmission of HPV through the, um, through the vaccine, it's anticipated that the incidence of HPV-mediated oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma would decrease. You'll notice that these authors were not, um, not as steadfidious as they should have been because they say HPV-mediated oral and oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we don't think that the tie between HPV and oral cancer is strong. We really think it's that subset of oral pharyngeal. Um, so just to summarize, the link between HPV and that subset of oral pharyngeal is very clear and well established. We think that it's transmitted through oral sex, and we think as the number of partners increases, your chance for uh, getting it increases significantly. Thank you.